I think obsession is the, the fact that you use that word uh, is, is, is almost key. I mean, uh, if you're not obsessed about what you do, then, uh, I think that there's a void in, in kind of the work ethic that you're going to be putting out. Uh, you almost have to be obsessed with it because the odds are against you. Yeah. So, you know, uh, the, the odds are against you. And, and, and that's something that honestly, the, the, the work ethic is going to come into play. Welcome back to the Beyond the Wealth podcast. I'm your host, Andres Sanchez. Today, I have Dylan Kapnick, the CEO and founder of the General Contractors Design Group. Dylan has a really cool company doing a lot of great work down here in the South Florida area, what the area that I call home. Yep. Thank you so Likewise. much for coming on the show. We were Dre hooked us up and connected us, so thank you, Dre, for making that connection happen. I'm really excited to chat. I have not had anybody on the show in the home, home improvement space, so check the box, new niche for me to interview awesome. somebody on. Awesome. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. For sure. Again, thank you for making the trip down here. And of course. I'm really excited to dive into your business and everything that you've built, but I think it's just a good way to start is give the the, the audience your 30-second pitch on who Dylan is. Uh, wow. So again, thanks for having me. Uh, super excited to be here. Uh, we... So... Uh, we, we are a design build firm, so we specialize in general contracting, uh, interior design. We do everything from the initial implementation of architectural planning and the, the kind of the concept to the design and then the build, the, the heavy duty construction, uh, and then back to the finishes and, and the final product of the home. Um, I'm a certified general contractor, a licensed interior designer, and the CEO of, of, of this particular company. And uh, throughout my career and, and throughout uh, the years, I've had uh, a couple of the various companies, whether it be construction or design. And so uh, that's led to to what we are and who we are now. Awesome. Yeah. And and why the construction general contact, contracting space? I think your parents had a company in the space. Is that the reason why you decided to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, I always love the business. Uh, it's a tough business, but it was something that I was always... Um, you know, from a young age, I grew up in the business, so it was something that I was always exposed to. Uh, you know, from from a young kid, I was going to projects, going to construction sites, and going to marble mills and uh, different cabinet manufacturers. And so, I just kind of always grew up in real estate and development, and and seeing kind of construction as a whole. Uh, and then, as I got older, it became something that I really loved and and kind of took to. So it was something that I grew into, uh, grew up with, but then kind of developed my own. Uh, concept and business and and kind of what I was strong with uh, as a whole. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So in that journey, like you mentioned, you had other companies. Is the one that you're running now your first one, your baby? Did you have some more that led to this one? So my first company, I was nine years old. Uh, okay. I had my first company at nine. Um, it was uh, it was a long story, but basically it was it was a company that I did apparel and uh, accessories and. Later on, it was food and, and jewelry, but it was all related to pets. So apparel and accessories for pets. Um, it was something that I started at nine and had till about 15. Uh, we did everything from, you know, trade shows to uh, importing and exporting worldwide. Um, and that was before kind of online was strong. We're going back, you know, 15 plus years. So that was before uh, they had, you know, certain like, uh, you know, Chewy or certain big yeah. brands that they have online. Uh, this was more kind of local based than from, you know, Palm Beach to Miami, same thing that we're, we're doing now. Uh, and it just kind of evolved into this business where we grew from apparel to uh, the food industry uh, and, and then uh, jewelry and accessories. And we did we, custom manufacturing and importing. And so um, that was my first company at nine. And then, uh, I had another business where we did uh, stone importing. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the first, uh, dive into construction. If you will, we imported stone from all over the world. Uh, we did, you know, fabrication installation, uh, and then it was design and construction. And so, yeah, so a handful of companies throughout the years as I grew, uh, but, but that was my kind of first company as, as a child. Yeah. And I mean, there's definitely other people listening to this that are curious. How does a nine-year-old start a company? Like, where wh is your are your parents entrepreneurial? There's there had to have been something there. I feel like that led to a nine-year-old launching a a company like you. I was blessed, you know, to have great role models as parents. Um, my father was an entrepreneur. My mother uh, was in fashion and design, and so both of them were super hardworking and kind of instilled in in my sister and I a certain work ethic. Um, but 
it started as um, my mom hosting a party with a bunch of friends, and 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 it was actually a jewelry trunk show uh, where one of the, the the ladies there had showed me kind of a new business that she had started. And I think an hour later, I had like ten people ready to 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 come on board and and buy things from her. And she kind of said to me like, "Oh my God, like you're you're an amazing entrepreneur at nine years old. Like you should work for me." Uh, and after kind of thinking about it for a week or two weeks or three weeks, I kind of said, you know what, I, I can, I, I, I want to do that, but I can do that for her. I can do that for 20 or 50 other people. And so that's when I kind of got the idea that, you know what, I can kind of capitalize on this. This was when uh, people started to love their pets like, you know, family. And so they started investing into pets, whether it be, you know, accessories or, or apparel or, you know, the, the, the dietary restrictions. And so that's kind of what propelled me to do that. And um, I did it with just, you know, kind of the the, the, the ground up. So literally making the, the, the cold calls, uh, seeing if I could be a distributor for this company and start repping this brand. And uh, then after year after year, we kind of grew and scaled the business. And yeah. Dude, that's badass. Yeah, like, it was <laughs> cool. That's badass to have a company like that. And it's funny, I, I had a guest that came on who had a multi-million dollar. They, they basically... 2016 Instagram the algorithm kind of changed. They bought a Frenchie. Frenchie went viral. <laughs> yeah, they built a million dollar dog apparel business on the back of this Frenchie. I used so, to have my dog, and we used to use him as a little mascot and whatever works. Yeah. Hey, you know it's cheap labor, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. So then from there, you said you pivoted and you took your first dip into the construction type of business. You start importing stones. Where did you get the idea to start that? Um. So I grew up with with having a family business that I was, you know, always active in, whether it be summertime or just kind of looking at my father and and kind of admiring, you know, his work ethic and what he had kind of developed at the time. Uh, and we saw a need for the market where granite kind of was like o- overtaking the market. Everyone had those granite countertops that with the crazy patterns in their kitchens. And so um, I used to go and actually hand select the, the, the kind of the stone and the natural stone and. Uh, the clarity. It's kind of like, uh, honestly, the jewelry business where I had kind of vast knowledge. And so uh, you're picking, you know, a diamond. It's similar in the stone business. There's different qualities and different grades and different price points, origins. So I actually would, would take the time to go do that at a super young age. And that developed into me seeing a need in the market for that. And so um, we literally got like a brick and mortar store. Uh, I, you know, created the concept, the, the marketing, the, the overall kind of product lines that we were going to be carrying. Uh, and then we assembled a really experienced, amazing team behind that to, you know, build the company. I was the, obviously I was in school, but I was super active when, when I had time, uh, and we, we scaled that business and it was super successful when we had it. I ended up transitioning and having another one of our companies kind of take it over uh, because obviously as a kid and, and growing up and getting ready for college and stuff like that, it it, it, it took too much of my time, um, but it was super successful when we had it. And that kind of propelled me into, again, having a love for the industry and, and wanting to do this for, you know, full time. I recently took my journey into the world of diamonds. I got engaged like three months awesome. ago. Think, Congratulations. Thank you. Maybe That's four cool. months ago. Um and I didn't know <laughs> how complex the process of buying the diamonds, the different types, colors, the cuts, grade, the, everything. It everything. was crazy. I showed up to the jewelry store with my like notes, my paper, what I wanted. <laughs> and the guy probably thought it was insane. I felt like I was on Shark Tank trying yeah. to buy this <laughs> ring. But what did the process look like for you? Like, were you flying to other countries to go see this granite? Is it something that is locally made here in the US? Everything was imported. So okay. uh, when I was like, doing the manufacturing and importing for my first company. And then for this, everything being in, you know, South Florida and Miami, you, we have, we have great ports, we have great, you know, accessibility to certain things that are kind of worldwide. And so everything was being brought here, but I was super active. I went to a lot of different trade shows. Um, I did, you know, I, I was able to kind of see things elsewhere and, and kind of, uh, familiarize myself with certain product lines, but I was able to see a lot here and, and just be super active with trade shows. Um, you know, Growing up, I always had an entrepreneurial spirit. And so um, I think even as a young kid, just inherently, I asked the right questions. I wanted to know everything. Uh, I used to get like a funny, common, like, you know, 13 going on 30 comment. Yeah. And so I think it was more of me wanting to know so much that knowledge is power and just taking it in and, um, you know, being able to 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 utilize that to my advantage to become familiar with 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 what was on, you know, available in the market. 
I have a lot of entrepreneurs like yourself that sit in that seat and talk about experiences where they had companies or they took their first dip into entrepreneurship in high school and in college like yourself. And that's such a pivotal time in your life as just an individual, like a young guy in that time period. It's such a crazy time. Yeah. Do you ever feel like you missed out on stuff or was it hard to balance business or were you just like obsessed to the point that this life didn't really matter? Like I was all in on business. So I'll be honest. I think obsession is the, the fact that you use that word uh, is 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 almost key. I mean, uh, if you're not obsessed about what you do, then uh, I think that there's a void in, in kind of the work ethic that you're going to be putting out. Uh, you almost have to be obsessed with it because the odds are against you. Yeah. So, you know, uh, the, the odds are against you. And, and, and that's something that honestly, the, the, the work ethic is going to come into play. I, I had a normal childhood. I mean, I hung out with a lot of friends. I did a lot. I was super active. I was an athlete as well. Um, even before my first company, I was a childhood actor. So uh, you know, I was always doing stuff, but on my spare time, you definitely have to manage your time. Even as a young kid, you know, I, uh, probably when, when other kids had downtime or were just messing around and playing video games, uh, I did that too. You know, I don't want to say that I didn't have that, that part of my childhood, but I was definitely putting in the hours, definitely putting in the work, uh, spending my time, making sure that fundamentally I was, I was running my company. And as a young kid, uh, I, 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 I made it a point to, be responsible in that asset. I didn't want the help. I didn't want my parents doing things for me. I didn't want um, to hire someone or to have someone kind of managing certain things that I built and I created. And so that was super important to me at a young age that whatever I did, I wanted to kind of own it and do it myself. Um, and I think it paid off in the long run tremendously because it, it enabled me to understand at a very young age what it means to own a business, run a company and have those responsibilities. Yeah, I had somebody on the show recently and we talked about how social media shows you 99% of what entrepreneurship isn't. Like it looks amazing, it looks fun, it looks easy, but like really being an entrepreneur is so tough and time management and the ability to juggle multiple things, wear different hats is so hard. And I think it's just common that I see entrepreneurs who started young and dealt with really juggling things when in reality the risk wasn't really there like per se if the company failed you're still going to go to high school you're still going to go to college you're still going to be fine but you learn these valuable skills where you have to balance like well, I really want to hang out with my friends but I also really want my business to be successful and that translates over to now when we're older it's, we're kind of faced with the same thing especially living here in Miami it's like yeah I could go out on Saturday to live or 11 I could go out on Friday nights to the regatta or the wharf or whatever yeah. it is now, whenever it's popular, but I got to go and work. And we go back to that obsession, being obsessed with that double tap on that, because it seemed like it sparked something in you to talk about that. Like, what is it like to really be obsessed with something? Um, you know, the odds are against you, like I mentioned. And so that's just with life. That's just being an entrepreneur. I mean, the, 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 the percentage of you succeeding is so low. And yeah. so if you don't have that drive, like that's one thing that, that you mentioned that's absolutely true. You have to want to do it. Like yep. you have to want to be that guy. You have to want to be that person because otherwise, uh, you know, you, you can have 50% or 20% or you can have certain characteristics of what it means to, to really succeed. But if you're not all in and you're not obsessed, if you don't literally coach yourself, even when times are, are not going right for you, that, that you need to be doing this and you're meant to be doing this and, and, and you, you're doing this for a particular reason. Uh, you're not going to succeed. And even as someone who I'd like to think is super successful because I, I put the work towards being that, uh, there's there's times where literally, you know, it, it's it's me having to coach myself through that. Um, I think if you're not obsessed and you're not making that effort to want to be that person, it's not going to happen. So it, 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 you know, there's a little bit of luck, but most of it's hard work and it's dedication and it's making those sacrifices and, you know, I had those times too, where I went out and I hung out with friends. And so I had, I had the social life, you know, I don't want to say that I didn't because balance is key, but, um, you know, at this point in my life, it's, it's all about, you know, the, the end goal. Yeah, it's, it's borderline delusional. Like some people just, some people would hear that and be like, that doesn't make sense. But like an entrepreneur, I mean, you're borderline delusional in the fact that you are so confident that you will succeed doesn't matter what anybody tells you and that's a key part of why entrepreneurs go from 
successful, like, or become successful and some kind of fizzle off and fall off, you've got to be obsessed and like borderline delusional and like that I will succeed. Most entrepreneurs are misunderstood. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, it, they, they joke and say that that means that you might be onto something because most of the time, the kind of out of the box thinking, the, the, you know, ornate person of being an entrepreneur is what does succeed because you're not following the trend. You're not following those kind of parameters. And so, um, most of the time you're looked at as either over the top or crazy or left field. And so that is kind of, you know, somewhat of an indication that, you know, you might be doing something right. You might be on to something big. Yeah. So now we're talking about the company that you own right now. Yeah. That is your main focus, your main priority. How long has that business been uh, active? We're on, we're on our fourth year. Okay. Yeah. Lucky we're, number, that's my lucky number. Four. There you go. Okay. Great we're year. on our fourth year, and we're proud to be on our fourth year. Um, I know, you know, any new business, it's those kind of three to five years starting out that are that are super tough and trying and, and, and pinnacle. And so uh, being on our fourth year, we're proud to be there. Awesome. And and what do you think was the catalyst to this business being successful? Like what was kind of that turning point for you where, because everybody launches a business and you go through the roller coaster of the ups and downs. What was that kind of pivotal moment where you're like, I think this is what I'm going to do for the next 20 years of my life or if you exit the company otherwise? So I have my reasons as an individual, but to be honest with you, they say that if you can find like an issue or a void in something or you find uh, something that needs to be fixed, then, you know, you, you might have a, a proper business. Yep. Um, you know, for us, we're a duly licensed firm. So we take on the, like I said, the implementation, the design, the concept, and then we take on the build. A lot of the times, especially when you're in our market, which is the super high end upper escalon market. A lot of those clientele, they, they're, they're hiring multiple people to kind of put on this production of, of doing a new construction build or a remodel. You know, they, they hire an architect to, to derive the plan. They hire a designer to pick the finishes and, and the concept of this and the concept of that. And then they pick the actual contractor or the builder to, to flourish it and to implement it. And so uh, although that sounds great and you have certain expertise in each field that you're selecting, you know, to get all those people in, in one room on one yeah. project to, to orchestrate it properly, that's where a lot of the problems happen. And so uh, throughout my career, I so I took over our family business and I ran that company for close to eight years. I was the acting vice president and CEO of that company. Um, and I ran that company from A to Z for eight years strong. And over the time, there were things that we didn't do as a whole. There, there, we specialized in interior remodeling, kitchen and bath. And so uh, if we were doing a huge home and there were certain aspects that we weren't doing. So I worked with a lot of developers, a lot of builders, a lot of designers, and um, some were great, some were awesome. And some, I, I just was like amazed with kind of the nuances and the issues that they were having. And it was a lack of knowledge, a lack of control, a lack of um, really the cohesive kind of structure that you need to successfully complete a project. And so that's when I kind of at a young age said like, this can't be, you know, th th this can't be happening. This can't be the reality. I, I, I feel like I can do better and, and there should be a better option for people. And so, um, you know, being a design build company is what it's formally referred to as and being one of the only few in South Florida that is truly duly licensed. Um, I kind of saw a void where a lot of people weren't taking advantage of a company that has the ability to, to do all of those facets and all of those facets well. And so that's when kind of the concept came into play and, and I made efforts to, to build that. So just from my understanding and then people listening, simplicity is the real kind of idea behind this of like, don't go and talk to eight different people to get one thing done. You could do it all under our roof and we're licensed in all these different areas. That's the market that you're trying to attract. So we have like a saying under one roof. And so the, the concept is, you know, you, you need someone who's experienced, you need someone who's credentialed, you need someone who has the ability. But uh, obviously, if you can have one person own it and one person be responsible and one person, you know, take it with stride and, and take it on full throttle, I mean, that's the benefit. Uh, you're dealing with one person, you, 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 you have one person that's responsible for the whole project and, you know, it becomes, you know, you're doing surgery on someone's home. So it yeah. becomes, you know, kind of someone that you confide into ship things and, and put things in front of you in the right perspective. And that's why I think we've been truly successful in the short amount of time, because we've given the market an option 
that is not usually so readily available to them where we will take it on, you know, from A to Z. Um, also something super unique about us. So, uh, you know, we handle the design, we handle the build, but we also are uh, authorized dealers of over 100 different product lines. So from porcelain uh, flooring and quartz countertops and wallpaper and cabinetry and furniture and everything that you would need to, to truly kind of flourish a home, we are the AD, the end user of over 100 different product lines. So not only are we designing it, we're building it, but we're also sourcing and providing you the products that are necessary for you to truly build your home. And so um, the accessibility, the price point, the quality, uh, the, the product knowledge, you know, how to install this, this floor, or how to, uh, you know, utilize this, this, this cabinetry or whatever it may be, uh, we have that benefit because we're trained and we actually are the authorized dealers of these product lines. So as a company, as a whole, it's really the one-stop shopping experience. Dude, I mean, I mean, you're selling me yeah. right now. Like we're talking off camera. I'm about to buy a home and it's most likely going to be one I'm going to have to remodel and do stuff. And got you. <laughs> you're kind of scaring me with like, oh, you got to talk to this person, this person. I, I want to work with someone like you or I could just work with one business. It's overwhelming and it's it's something that, you know, on the other side of the fence where maybe I was doing one facet of the job, maybe I was just doing a high-end kitchen for someone and they were going through a whole remodel, you know, I'd, I'd kind of be in awe of seeing the process and kind of what they were dealing with as the homeowner, as the client, you know, as someone who's supposed to be having a good experience and a positive experience and someone who's kind of supposed to be, you know, catered to, especially at that kind of, you know, luxury high-end market, um, but dealing with, you know, having to go from here to there and having to deal with these decisions and, and, and put out the certain costs that's associated with, you know, the unforeseen and the what ifs and the, I didn't figure that. And so again, you know, because of the fact that we're experienced in, in both categories, because of the fact that, you know, we take on the project as a whole, uh, we try to provide the proper experience for a client who's doing a home to where we take on 50% of that. You know, we take on 50, we need a little bit of your input. We need a little bit of your guidance, but yeah. we take on the project as a whole and own it. And I think that's super important. Something you mentioned earlier of like you're doing surgery on their home. Yeah. It's interesting because like a home is so personal to someone. What are some of the headaches you have to deal with in that job of oh, like, man. man, you're working like you're you're now dealing yeah. with someone's baby, the home they built, they've lived in 20, 30 years. What are some of the challenges you have to face with that? Um, you know, something that I've learned being in construction, and I think honestly, you can apply this with any CEO or any operator in any company. You know, it's not knowing the answer, it's finding the answer. Uh, you know, if you're a proper operator and you're going to be someone that's in a managerial position, you know, you're going to get things thrown at you that you haven't dealt with before. I've I've done over, you know, 500 projects, maybe even close to a thousand different properties throughout South Florida. I learned, you know, there's something new every day that I'm yeah. learning, that I'm having to deal with, that I'm having to kind of overcome or pivot or, or um, I'll get calls from, you know, my project managers like freaking out about, uh, you know, whether it be, you know, something didn't come in right, you know, so something's the wrong color or uh, we opened up a wall and there is a structural beam that wasn't on the architectural plans. And it's just, you know, stuff every day that you have to deal with. And I think um, someone that is dealing in that capacity of being a true operator or being someone in, 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 in an authoritative position, you just have to realize that whatever it is, it is, and you have to deal with it and you have to hit it head on, but it's about finding the, the proper answer, uh, not knowing it necessarily all the time. Cause in construction, it's similar to medicine. It's similar to law. I mean, you're not going to know everything all the time. Yeah. So it's just a matter of taking things with stride, but, um, we deal with stuff like that all the time. Unforeseen things, you know, we demo a floor and there's another floor underneath or we remove a wall and, Whatever the implementation was, it wasn't on the existing plans and, you know, it, it's behind the wall. Who knows that it was there? And so you're dealing with that um, corroded pipes or leaky roofs or whatever it may be, you know. But again, it's just a matter of, of taking on the problem with stride and dealing with it as it comes to you. This might be a little bit of a selfish question. Yeah. Someone who's getting ready to buy a sure. home in South Florida. Yeah. Would, I, I've lived here my whole life in, in this area. You like you said you you you're a South Florida native, grew up around the area. What do you think about this just astronomical boom in home prices and the just continued people moving to this area? Like, do you think we're in a bubble? Do you think like? And again, please, if, if you don't want to answer this, feel don't no don't no feel I like, like your need question, to, I mean, but like it, it's just insane to me. Like, I took the boat out the other day with my fiance on Monday for a birthday. We we're just driving slowly up a by Lagorce and, and Miami Beach in that area. We're just 
looking up the homes that are there, it's like 45 million, 38 million. Oh, here's this empty grass lot, 20 million for the grass. I'm like, man, I've grown up here my whole life. This to me seems like we're just hockey sticking. It's interesting because I, so you and I have grown up in South Florida our whole lives. And so I think we're accustomed to it. I think we're used to it. But so many of my friends, and I have a lot of international friends, I have a lot of friends from, you know, up north. And, uh, you, you know, I think we take it for granted a little bit. Yep. Uh, you know, we're in a little bit of a bubble, a little bit of a boom. You can, you can say what you want, but it, you know, when you look at everything, it makes sense. You know, the quality of life, uh, taxes, uh, just economic growth, you know, South Florida and as a whole is just, uh, historically always been on the up and up and so um you look at major metropolitans and the economics and you know kind of what goes on in the world and what has gone on in the world previously i mean it 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 makes sense when you look at south florida as why you know half the world wants to move here and why there's been a boom so i think the market's always going to fluctuate a lot of factors play into that of course um but i think it is something that consistently is going to be you know prosperous as historically it's been and uh, for me being in my industry, that's, that's good for me, but also being, uh, you know, just a South Florida native and someone that plans on living here for, you know, the rest of my life or full time. I mean, you know, I want, I want South Florida to grow and I, I think it, the, the prices are crazy. You know, it's certainly, you know, I, I look at certain, uh, areas too, and I can't believe like the price per square foot and, and what's happened to certain condos, certain neighborhoods. I mean, it's crazy. Um, but it does make sense when you look at it as a whole. I mean, the quality of life is just amazing down here. With your industry and being in that luxury market, how much of this has been a beneficiary for you of the success of your business? I mean, you've been in business for four years. You could say these last four years have been the biggest growth kind of per se in luxury living in South Florida. What a perfect time for you to launch this business. So it's actually interesting. We launched during COVID and uh, it was interesting. I had so much... so. Having been second generation to a, at that time, 30 year old, you know, 30 plus year old company, um, when I told everyone, hey, I'm, you know, going to branch off and start this new venture, uh, everyone, you know, thought I was like insane. And so, especially when, when, when you, you take the time to position yourself in your current career to uh, make that exit or make that transition and uh, the certification and the licensing in, in, in my case and and kind of just the investment of of building that company from the ground up and then COVID hits, uh, it, it kind of changed things. You yeah. Know? So, um, you know, everyone told me it's not the time, you know, the world's changed. Like you, you, you can't, you can't open this company. And we waited it out and we, 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 we just took it again with stride. And, um, you know, after the four years, yeah, I mean, it, it certainly paid off. I think that uh, it's super interesting to see the the type of clientele that's changed. So we kind of had like a very particular type of clientele, a very common t- type of clientele. Um, we now, after, you know, throughout the four years, we've grown a, a tremendous amount. So we actually have three locations. Uh, we have one in Miami, uh, one in Palm Beach, and one in Boca Raton, our flagship in Boca Raton. And that's a brick and mortar. That's uh, it's by appointment only. It's it's tucked away in a building. Uh, we're we're kind of behind the scenes, but yeah, it's a it's a design center, state yeah. of the art, uh, which we're super proud of. We we just developed, and so where the other ones are more of design studios, this is really where uh, it, it's more of a marketplace that people can come and kind of design their home from A to Z. But um, you know, we've had kind of a really interesting, vast uh, majority uh, of clientele that has changed throughout the years because of, I think the boom and, and the shift and a lot of people moving to South Florida. So we don't have the northerners, uh, only more, we have a lot of international clients. Now we have people from the Midwest. I mean, it's, it's really diverse in, in the kind of clientele that we've seen. So that I think has changed things, uh, quite a bit. In a lot of the articles that I read about you and your business, it really highlights the emphasis you all put on technology with virtual reality and some of that. Dig deeper or explain further to to the audience what your company's doing in that space and and why you've all put an investment now towards that being an integral part of the experience you deliver. So again, I'm, you know, although I feel super seasoned uh, in, in this field, I'm part of the younger generation. And so Part of my experience and seeing what has kind of gone wrong uh, with with other projects and kind of other, uh, you know, construction uh, projects that I've seen throughout the years is that uncertainty. Um, you know, you said what what kind of can go wrong on a project? Well, there's always the unforeseen, the constructual unforeseen or 
the implementation being wrong. But a lot of the clients, uh, especially the elder clients that typically are the ones spending a certain amount, you know, um, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80 years old, uh, half the time they don't even remember, you know, what they, they purchased or what the design was or what they're getting. And so I think it's super important for us to be able to showcase exactly what they're getting, how it's going to be implemented, and exactly what the model or the module is going to look like. So over time, we've developed a certain technology, a certain you know uh, system, where we can literally take the concept and the, the the overall idea from inception and literally present it to you as a three D module and bring it to real life. And so that's something that throughout the years has been super important to me because I think again the the, the key to a success uh, in this field is having the control knowing exactly what's going to be done from A to Z. And so for us to be able to showcase that and present that to the client as, you know, this is the finished product has been super beneficial for us. Yeah. In all the articles, it touched on it. And to me, I didn't think about it that like, yeah. that wasn't my first thought of like, oh, I would want to use virtual reality for my home improvements. But then I thought about it and I'm like, man, these VRs are, are so badass. And like, you can see really what a room would look like what a perfect fit that is for that business. So the other cool thing is uh, a lot of, you know, this, 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 our technologies and our process is different um, in, in a sense where because we're an authorized dealer of all of these different product lines, we're using the physical products. Uh, so we're not, you know, where a lot of people are using inspiration, they call it mood boards or inspirate or inspo boards or whatever it may be. They're showing you an idea. They're showing you an example. We're showing you the actual product. We're showing you the your room or your home or whatever the, the, the space is to scale. So we're taking the field measurements. We're taking the actual dimensions and the designations. And we're, we're literally showing you your room, your space, your products, your materials, and how it's going to be implemented. Um, and then we have the technology within our design studio to, to design in real time. So that's something that uh, that's probably been mentioned or you've probably seen uh, over time, the ability to design in real time. So if you were our client and we were doing a, you know, a full remodel for you, we literally have the ability to change the design theme, to change the materials in real time. So you're at our design center, you go pick out a white kitchen. Uh, now you want to see a gray kitchen in a matter of minutes, we can put that on the module. You could pick the profile, you could pick the finish, you can pick the style. And so that can be depicted in the 3D module. So again, you know exactly what you're getting. And it's using the certain technologies that we've developed over time to be able to do that. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, would you say your company is ahead of the curve in the industry from that perspective? Or? I think so. I mean, I it's something that we su you know are, are super keen on striving to to give that uh, experience to our clients. So I think where others uh, you know could do it in theory or... Uh, maybe have done, you know, kind of, um, you know, 50 percent uh, uh, of what we do. I think because it, I feel it's so important, I think that we are kind of paving the path and leading the, the way in terms of that technology and that concept as a whole. Plus, again, most people aren't going to spend the time to showcase uh, areas of the project that they're not a part of. So a builder is not going to spend the time to, to focus on materials because he's not designing the home. And same thing with the designer. They, they're they going to pick the materials. They're going to the, pick what looks pretty, but they're not going to focus on the, the construction, the implementation, and how it works in correlation with your space. So I think that that's something that also, also plays a, a big factor in it. Awesome. Yeah. So let's get into the nitty gritty part of the business because yeah. we have tons of entrepreneurs that listen. And sure. they always ask, like, get the guests to explain how they made the business work. So what would you say was the the main way that you were able to scale this business? How did you go and acquire customers? How did you start to become successful? Like what were some of the levers you were pulling on the back end? So uh, when I was uh, with my other company and I was second generation, I, I worked with a lot of developers and I worked with a lot of builders. And I actually, uh, one of my jobs was to be the creative director of implementing designs and concepts for large developers that were building homes and coming up with new concepts. And so um, from a product knowledge and, and, and from kind of a, a viewpoint of understanding what a prospective client would want, I had a lot of exposure to that. When I first started my company, I literally started like with $5,000, uh, just starting little bit by little bit by little bit. Um, my first project was, uh, 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 you know, one of my friend's parents. And 
Um, you know, now it's crazy to think that we're, we, you know, we have a minimum spend, we're super selective. We only take on certain type of projects, but at that point it was like, whatever it meant to, to, to be, whatever it took to make it work, I did. Um, and so, you know, your pride and ego has to stay at the door. You have to yeah. do whatever it takes. So whatever, you know, even if it wasn't something I was comfortable with, uh, I, I, I took it kind of, you know, hundred miles an hour. And so my first project was one of my friend's parents. Um, another one was just word of mouth. And then kind of deriving this marketing plan and advertising. And um, it was actually funny because we marketed our company uh, out the gate just as the, the premier, the luxury, the, 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 the experts. And part of that was because of my kind of previous background. But the other part of that was because, um, you know, perception is reality. And so, uh, you know, you, you have to have the expertise and you have to have the skill set to be able to back it up. But, you know, we wanted to market ourselves for the type of clients that we wanted to attract. So... Um, little bit by little bit, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, everyone, uh, wants to go for the quick win. You know, they, they, it's, it's real easy to make a little bit of money. It's real hard to make a lot of it. And yep. so, um, to be a successful long term, uh, it takes just time and, and it takes hard work and, uh, that can be cliche. A lot of people say that, but it's true. You know, uh, everyone thinks that they do something for one week and, you know, they, they put the time in, not how it works. And even as a young, eager previously successful entrepreneur, I had those moments where I was like, damn, I am putting every single moment of my time into this. I'm busting my ass. And it's just, it's like, it, I'm not there yet, but um, you just have to keep going and you have to keep telling yourself to keep moving forward. And so little bit by little bit, you start to grow. We, we had great traction. Um, I will tell you now three locations, uh, great, big, amazing state-of-the-art design center. I started with, with no office. I started with a home office. I started with no staff. You know, I was the designer, the builder, the project manager, the secretary. Um, I was the project coordinator. I was uh, accounts receivable. Like it was a one man band. Um, I remember when I first got my big, like my first big project, I could afford, you know, to hire someone. I hired an assistant. That assistant, like her job, I, I you, hiring her, I said, you, you just get ready to wear many hats. So, <laughs> You're going to be, if I need you there, uh, you know, opening up a, a project for contractors, like you're going to be there. I don't care if you're my assistant or what you are, but you're going to, you know, you're going to be that kind of second hand, that second string. Um, and then we just grew again and, and, and it was hard work. It was dedication. Um, but it was also, it was also going the extra mile. You know, I also, you know, in construction in any business, there's always things that are going to happen that are going to go astray. And so you have to, you have to live with what you can live with. And so something that I always kind of lived by and in, in whatever we were doing was, you know, did I make the effort? Did I put in the attempt? You know, did I find the best price point or did I, did I make sure that whatever we were doing was the best option for the client? And so over time that really paid off because it, I got to really gain the trust of our clients. Um, it led to a ton of referrals. And so I think now we're like uh, something crazy, like sixty-five or seventy-five percent, uh, like referral base. So that's amazing. Yeah, that's ideal for any business. Yeah. Referrals are like the the hottest leads you could get. And it's funny because it used to piss me off because um, I spent so much time uh, on our marketing and on our advertising. And so if that worked or didn't work, I'd be so much more focused on that than just getting a referral. Yeah. Because I, in my brain, I said to myself, "Well, of course we're getting a referral. You know, we're we're doing everything for the client." Um, but I realized very quickly that in this business and, and in most businesses, that's that's key, you know. How important is customer service to you and your business? That that might be a simple question because it's an obvious answer, but... It's I, everything. I mean, there's a fine line, you know. It, 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 the answer is it's everything. And I think in every business, like, if you can literally say to yourself, you made the attempt once, twice, a hundred times, you know, you always have to take the high road. Uh, I tell a lot of my my the people on my team, you have to land the plane. Uh, you ha you have to you have to take the high road. I mean, there is no bigger person in the room. It's business. So you're here to provide a product, a service, an experience for someone. And so I think that that's super important. Uh, but you know, you you have to also have kind of your process and 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 your structure. And so you have to be stern in that aspect. You know, you do know best as the expert, as the one with the expertise. So. You have to be able to steer the ship the way that you feel is most successful, but you you have to you know obviously have a certain degree. If a client wants something, you know you're you're there to you know you're there to please. So, do you have a favorite project that you've done? Uh, that might be a tough question, but I don't have a favorite 
project, but I have a favorite type of client. So I, I, you know, this might sound obvious, but in my uh, work, you know, there's people that are very adamant and very particular in what they want. So they want to choose everything. I mean, it would, it would be similar to any, you know, uh, any business, a, a jewelry business, buying a car, you know, there's people that want this spec specification. They, they, they want it this way. They want it this big, this large, whatever it may be. Uh, and so that's fine. It's great because you, you get, you get direct feedback. And so it's kind of easier for you to function because you know what they want and what they, what they don't want. Yeah. But as a creative, if you have a vision or you see kind of other areas that you could expand on and they're not willing to listen or kind of, you know, take that into consideration, you know, sometimes you feel like the project could have been more than, than what it was. Um, when I have clients that literally give me what we call like heart blanche, just, you know, what's your vision? I'm leaning on you to kind of guide me and show me and, and, and kind of pre present to me this finished product that you see fit. Uh, that's usually my favorite project because I haven't had one yet in the 1000 clients that I've had where if that's been the opportunity that I've had to kind of come in and do my own thing, um, it, it, you know, it's always been successful. And of course, you have to get to know the client. You have to listen. I mean, listening is, is key to success um, in any business. If you, you know, 50% of the battle is listening and it's not listening to, to, you know, listen to, to wait when they're done speaking so that you, it's your turn to speak. You know, it's listening to, to the key factors or the key pinnacle things that they want um, and utilizing that to provide the service that's shifted and geared towards them. So you obviously had a segue into this industry, but now you've had the ability to have your hands in multiple different facets of it. Now, obviously with the whole portfolio, if there's somebody listening right now that's interested in getting into the construction business, getting into the interior design business, what advice would you give them on how to break in and how to go and, and start a career in that industry? Um, so I think it would be important for them to identify where they want to end up. You know, um, yes, I had all the opportunities in the world where, you know, I was able to kind of, you know, take advantage of and then, you know, deliver. But um, it all started with where I wanted to end up in the long run. And so making those small goals um, and, and achieving those small checkpoints to, to get to where you want to be is, is super important. And so uh, whether it be the super high end market, whether it be, you know, the commercial aspect, whatever area they want to end up, I would I would focus on how to get there. So if they want to end up in development. I would, you know, obviously seek a, a, a smaller position at a development company than opposed to if, you know, they wanted to be in design, obviously they'd be looking for design. But um, first you need to know where you want to end up for you to be able to position yourself to start out. And so that would be my advice to um, really kind of hone in on that and then use those building blocks to get there. You mentioned here in our conversation about having an ideal customer. You said now you, you, you've been able to be much more selective, have a minimum spend. For somebody listening who might be in a position where they might want to use your service sure. or reach out, what does that threshold look like? Like, I, I want to make sure if someone's interested, they can go and reach out to you if sure. fit is there. Um, so, you know, we are kind of that company that never says no yeah. uh, to a degree. So. You know, once you're our client, especially, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very about, you know, you mentioned customer service. It's the, the can do attitude. Um, you know, we do have typically, we, we like to have a hundred thousand dollars spend. Uh, and you know, we, we go up to projects that are, you know, one to 5 million. Um, we, we, uh, our median spend is a half a million to, to a million, uh, where clients are coming and either doing, you know, a new remodel a condo renovation, an addition, whatever it may be. Obviously, if they're doing new construction, presumably, you know, they're they're spending a bit more and, yeah. and it's in the higher numbers. But um, that's kind of where our bread and butter is. All right. Shit. Well, if you got deep pockets and you want to go and redo <laughs> your home, this is your ideal. It adds up. It adds up. I mean, it's... Dude, it's... As, as someone who's doing it now, like I almost just closed on the house and... and before it, it kind of went south, we were starting to budget and look at what we were going to do, what renovations. Money just starts disappearing just out of nowhere. It's like 30,000. Everything now, though. I mean, everything. Yeah, I mean. It, what, what, it, food. I mean, every You go to dinner, it's 200 bucks. Right, right. exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's it's always relative. But um, there is a certain of, you know, level of, of quality and craftsmanship. And, you know, 
when you are purchasing assets, obviously you want to protect those assets long term. So, you know, putting the money into it in a proper, sophisticated way to where it will yield you over time, um, I think is super smart, especially in your home or in something that you're spending a certain pretty pretty penny on in the first place. So I think that's important. Yeah, for sure. And, yeah. and I mean, like for people that don't know that much about real estate and then buying a home, if you're going to get to that point investing in a new kitchen, investing in new bathrooms, investing in an addition are high ROI things you can do for your home, your asset per se, 100%. that will add value in the long term. So it's not just spending egregious money. If you can spend the money and bear the 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 nuance of it, because construction is construction, yeah. right? So if you can spend the money and you can bear the nuance and you can bear the time, I always tell my clients, I mean, you really have to make a big mistake to not have that ROI on that that expense and that 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 value that you're putting into your asset because it's inevitable, you know? Um, the cost of construction, the cost of goods, it goes up every year. So, you know, if you build a home in 2020, uh, you, you know, obviously, you know, over time, it's going to, to, to yield you something huge. Yeah. So a question outside of our conversation here on just business. Yeah. I was going through your Instagram you seem to travel a lot and I've gone to a lot of amazing places. Yeah. I love to travel. So of course. complete, just out of curiosity question, what's your favorite place you visited in the world? Wow. Um, I love Italy. <laughs> and a lot of people probably say that, but I love, um, you know, it's the one uh, area where I love the North. I love the South. Uh, I love the, the, you know, Tuscany, the middle region. And so, um, just the culture, the people, the food, the, the, the craftsmanship in terms of their goods. Um, so that's probably been my favorite place. And what's cool about what we do being kind of geared in towards product and product knowledge and design and architecture. And, um, I love to travel. I think it's one of the blessings that, you know, anyone can have to be able to travel, but it's also super important for me to be on the up and up when it comes to design and products. And so, uh, although I love to travel for pleasure, I also make it a point every year to travel for business. Um, a lot of our manufacturers, a lot of the techniques that we utilize and bring into the States are from and 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 derived from Europe. So that's something that I also think, uh, I'm actually glad you mentioned it. I think it's something that kind of sets us apart from people. A lot of designers or a lot of architects or a lot of people that are in the design world when it comes to the home, they like to kind of copy and paste. They like to do what they're they're, they're used to doing. So over two, five, ten years, a lot of these designers, their 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 designs seem to be just identical. You know, they might change this, they might change that, but as a whole, it's the same. And so, it's super important for me, especially with having an international clientele, to be well versed in all of the different design schemes, all of the different products that are constantly becoming the next best thing or the next most durable product or whatever it may be. And so, traveling is a big part of that. I need to get myself a job where traveling to Europe for business is part of the equation because I, I love Europe. I love Italy. It's, or it's absolutely amazing, but it's, it's so true what you're saying. Yeah. One, we're in this kind of epidemic now where everybody puts gray laminate floors in every remodel, yeah. which is just atrocious. Yeah. I've been to like 60 open houses in the last eight weeks. But from your perspective, like you are dealing with international clients who have different tastes, like their taste is not maybe what the American taste Completely is different. If you don't go over there and expose yourself to that, you're leaving yourself exposed to underperforming for this massive client base that we know is moving here. I mean, we have this is one of or if not the biggest melting pot of cultures in any metropolitan area. Yep. You would be doing yourself and your business a disservice by not going out there and getting a feel for what the world's kind of taste is looking like. And we actually have an, a very international team in-house. Um in fact, I'm probably the only South Florida native that's that's part of the company. So we have international designers, um, people from up north. And so, again, they're kind of accustomed to certain things. And um, even the nomenclatures and the certain measurements and the certain kind of code requirements and uh, things that you wouldn't normally even think about are different. And so, again, that all kind of plays into being very well versed and having kind of a, a usability when you're dealing with international clients to be able to implement things here for them. It's I think it's certain certainly crucial. We've had this conversation now where we've kind of walked from your journey from start to finish. I mean, nine-year-old you selling dog apparel and, and clothing yeah, all the way up to you now, four years into this successful venture, a business that's thriving and continuing to grow. A question I always like to ask at the end of my interviews is, 
what is needed for you to look back in 10 years and say that you succeeded? Wow. It's a good question. <laughs> Feel free to think um, about it. Happiness. Happiness is key. And I think yeah, I, when you boil everything down, that's what everyone is searching for. You know, everyone, you know, people f associate it with wealth. You know, if I have this, I'll be happy. If I, if I get a girlfriend, I'll be happy. If I buy this house, I'll be happy. If I have this cool Lamborghini, I'll be happy. But at the end of the day, you know, they just want to be happy. And so I think to be proud of myself and, and, and one thing that I did mention is just putting in that effort so you can look back and say that you, you tried, you did it. Um, you only fail if you don't try. So whatever it is that you're toying with, whatever it is that you're up against that you want to do, but you don't know if you have the ability or the, the financial backing or, you know, the smarts or whatever, whatever your situation is, you have to just try, you have to just do it. Uh, and that's something that I think a lot of people deal with is regret. You know, they, they regret not doing this and they regret not doing that. And I made a promise to myself at a super young age that I wouldn't be one of those people. So whatever it is that I have in mind for myself, that's a goal. I make sure that every single day, uh, it, it, you know, I'll have good days, I'll have bad days, but every day, every week I'm striving towards that goal. And I think you have to be a certain individual to be able to do that, but that's key to whatever you want to do in life to be successful. I love it. Yeah. Before we wrap up here, I want to give you the opportunity to, because I mean, you're, you've clearly displayed here, you're a successful operator, you're a successful CEO. If you could give 30 seconds of advice to a CEO listening right now, what would that be? Um, it's funny. I had a conversation with one of my really good friends who I respect recently. He was a CEO, big operator of a huge company. He's been very successful and he was having uh, that moment, I think that a, a lot of us have in our careers where you're putting in the hours, you're putting in the effort and just everything seems to be going wrong. Yeah. Uh, and I've dealt with that uh, personally, professionally. I mean, I think everyone deals with it. But when you are in a high stress environment, when you're really working constantly, you know, it, it, it could take months, it could take years to where you kind of hone in and realize that it's an issue. Uh, and so uh, my one thing that that I told to him, and it was cool because I was able to kind of retell myself as I was telling him, was just to to keep going. Um, you know, you have to really believe in yourself. I think being successful and 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 being able to be successful is believing in yourself first. So you have to have the confidence. You 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 have to have that 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 know that you're in the right place, that you are the right person, that you're doing this for the right reason because you can. Um, so I think believing in yourself and being able to, to constantly remember that and remember who you are and, and be able to tell yourself that you're in this position for the right reason, uh, is super important. And thank you for that. The goal with this show is to impact at least one person per episode. Of course. And it's that right there. There's probably a CEO or a young entrepreneur listening who's just getting absolutely wrecked by all of these different things that gonna happen in business that might be what they needed to hear right there in that moment you have to just believe man and and you know what you you also have to believe that what whatever it is that you're going through it can only get better if you keep going if you move forward if you overcome it and so uh you know 50 percent of it is just to believe in yourself but before we got on camera, we talked about you were always behind the scenes, always connected. Now you're making that push to make content, yeah. be on social media. Yeah. That's a big reason why you're here. And yep. I'm excited to be now part of this journey. Thank you. Where can people go follow you, connect with you, reach out? Uh, so Instagram handle is the GC Design Group. You can find us on there. Uh, Instagram handle Dylan Kapnick. Um, Facebook, LinkedIn, website, uh, thegcdg.com. Uh, and check us out. We're going to have a lot of stuff coming for you in the, in the near future. Awesome. And all that stuff is going to be linked in the bio and the description below. So you're able to go reach out and connect with him. Thank you so much again for coming out here, being on the yeah. show and having this conversation with me. I appreciate it. I hope that I am uber successful and that I can use your services and 100%. have you redo yeah. my dream home. And again, congratulations on the continued success, brother. I appreciate it, brother.